not to be paranoid, but you know, you got to protect yourself if you're in a place where there's a big, powerful government that wants to take your gold. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, September 13th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, September 13th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Once again, if you are new to this channel or you have not already done so, please do subscribe, hit the bell to be notified on new updates, and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do. We really do appreciate your support. Today's guest, Jimmy Morrison, a filmmaker and the creator of The Housing Bubble a film that looks at the causes of the housing bubble that burst back in 2008 and other crises going from the Great Depression all the way to the dot-com bubble. Many of the people Jimmy interviewed in his film are familiar faces in the gold and silver world, and several of them have been guests on SBTV. We're delighted to have Jimmy as a guest and join us today. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Jimmy Morrison. Jimmy, welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. Glad you could make it. You are one very, very interesting, very interesting fellow, my man. You know, Jimmy, I I watched the housing bubble, and it was a sober reminder of the crisis of the past and what inflated these bubbles. But before we discuss the film, can you share with us your background and what led you to make this film? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I was studying economics at the University of Iowa way back in 2006. And so it was right as uh, housing was about to turn. And I had no idea. Um, but I dropped out of college to pursue film because I realized that if I got my degree in economics, uh, I'd never pursue film and, uh, you know, I'd have a cushy job and wouldn't be able to take those risks. And so I dropped out. I spent the money I'd saved for college on a camera and started shooting stuff. I uh, started going on the road filming bands and making music videos and uh, basically anything I could do to get camera experience. Um, and, you know, it was a great experience. But the the way that I kind of funded my lifestyle at the time when I dropped out was uh, I started a house painting business because it was someplace you could make a lot of money at the time. And uh, my problem was I started it literally the month that house prices peaked. And so I kind of you know, even though I wasn't like fully invested, like it's not like I owned a house or something like I, I got to watch all this unwind from the perspective of a house painter. Um, and, you know, I saw all the home equity loans and all those issues. And I basically realized that, you know, people weren't really paying for me to paint their house. They were just, you know, taking out home equity loans and borrowing money uh, at really low rates and all that. And so I kind of got uh, because of that, I kind of had the idea of getting back into economics a little bit, not as a career, but just as a hobby. Um, and I did a search for economics just for a torrent. Um, and I found an audiobook, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And he had written in the 1940s about Austrian economics and free markets and basically described how the housing bubble had played out. And so it gave me the idea that, you know, if he could write about it back then. We need a documentary now where we track down the people. Uh, that, um, you know, predicted this and asked them why it happened and uh, more importantly, you know, what's next. You know, are there any differences in the economics taught in school versus the real world? And you had a pretty good um, firsthand view of things going on at that time. Yeah, and I've, I've actually taken uh, enough economics classes to get an economics degree, um, but I haven't gone back and finished my degree just because, uh, as an entrepreneur, it really would serve no purpose for me. Um, it, you know, it's just a signal for employers that, hey, this guy uh, did all the work. But um, yeah, it's it's very different. Uh, you know, my textbook was written by Ben Bernanke, the former Federal Reserve chairman who was Federal Reserve chairman at the time. So, you know, it's not like you're going and learning about all these different schools of economics. You're just taught that what the government says is fact and that the Federal Reserve knows what they're doing and they saved us before and they're going to do it again. Um, so it was interesting when I took tests, I definitely had to like think for a second and be like, you, you should I pick the right answer or what I think is the right answer or what I think Ben Bernanke would think is the right answer. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting experience, but even beyond, um, like the fed and stuff like that, just mainstream economics, they post, they focus a lot uh, on math and models and things like, uh, assuming perfect information and perfect competition. 
And uh, when I made this documentary, I discovered Austrian economics. And I, I really love it because it doesn't do all that stuff. It's more about human action and, uh, you know, the effects of these policies and the effects of printing money. Um, but it doesn't uh, presume to be able to predict you know, what millions of people are going to choose to do or what billions of people would do or assume that they have perfect information, which is just kind of like an irrelevant, uh, you know, discussion to the real world. You, you touched on it a little bit, but how was your journey in, in making this film? I mean, can you tell us about the nights you, you slept in your car in the, the car parks mm -hmm. of Walmart? <laughs> yeah, so um it was uh may 2011 was when i first started actually shooting the movie uh and you know i'd worked on other projects leading up to that like i like i mentioned um and i had actually shot most of a movie uh on my own but um or with a small crew and uh kind of the experiences from that kind of taught me that like you know nobody else is going to do it for you you got to just go out and do it and so I booked some interviews and just kind of set out in my car. It was a little two-door Pontiac Sunfire. Um, and I didn't have any money. Like, I, I put all my money into buying a new camera because I had to, um, you know, upgrade uh, with doing the documentary. And uh, so I was literally sleeping in the back of my car. And, uh, you know, I'd wake up in a, a Walmart on the way to Montreal. I, I slept uh, just outside of Toronto in Mississauga. And, you know, I would be so anxious about these interviews, I'd literally throw up outside the car and then I'd have to go to a gas station, like get washed up uh, and then put on a suit. And I'd go interview someone like Mark Faber, who's, you know, called basically every craft since the 80s. And, um, you know, I, here I am just going in a gas station, washing my hair and then sitting down and uh, interviewing him for an hour about the economy. But uh, it was it was a great experience. You know, it was very difficult. Um, and I'm happy to say that I'm not sleeping in my car anymore when I shoot th this stuff or when we do screenings. Um, but uh, it's been a, a very long journey. I didn't think it would take us this long, but it, it became a much bigger project. We're going to have a sequel, uh, which we basically wrote at the same time. So it became a much more uh, encompassing project than I ever anticipated. Okay, so uh, Dr. Mark Faber was one of those names. And you also interviewed people like Dr. Ron Paul, Peter Schiff, Jim Rogers, Doug Casey, and, and Tom Woods. How did you find them, and what was your criteria selecting people for these these interviews, the interviewees? Mm -hmm. So the starting point was really uh, the idea for the film, which was to interview people that predicted the crash. And not everyone I uh, interviewed necessarily predicted it exactly, um, but it's what the core group uh, did, and it's what kind of connected me to all these people. And so... Um, what I discovered was, uh, you know, there weren't a lot of people that predicted the crash, and almost all of them were from the Austrian School of Economics. And when I went on to study the history, I, I saw that this was actually a pattern with the Great Depression and with the stagflation in the 70s and all these things. Uh, you know, the SNL crisis in the 80s. Um, this is a school of economics that cl claims they can't predict things, but they have a pretty good track record of actually um, showing where these booms and busts happen. So basically, I teamed up with Tom Woods. And when I discovered the Austrian School of Economics, uh, he had all these lectures on YouTube. And he had this uh, New York Times bestselling book, Meltdown, um, on the crash. And uh, when I saw his YouTube videos, like everything clicked. Like I'd, I'd read other books on the crash. Um, you know, I'd studied it. But this was like the the opening of my eyes to a, a whole new way of seeing the Fed and the and the world really, um, and so uh, that that led me to Tom. He was an obvious uh, choice to co-write it, and thankfully he agreed. Um, and he really helped me develop the list of you know, hey, these were people that when I wrote this book, uh, you know, I saw all the things that they predicted, and they were great resources for me. Like Mark Thornton's an economist that. Uh, is at the Mises Institute. That's just he's written a couple books on the subject, and he's just excellent on the issue. Uh, but we really tried to find, uh, you know, some economists, some investors, some finance people, um, and, and really get a broad range of of people that that predicted it. Um, so it really became me trying to present their view of what happened uh, through the documentary. Uh, which led to the fact that, you know, I'm not going to get an interview with Ben Bernanke or Paul Krugman or those people. And so what we had to do was license clips from those people because I didn't want to just find some low level economists and have them make their arguments and then just, you know, uh, pick on them because it, it's really not effective to do that. I wanted to have the most famous ones, the most popular ones presenting 
their ideas and then us just uh you know trying to show how ridiculous that is okay yeah which um which of the guys that you interviewed left uh, the greatest impression on you and and why yeah this is a question that i think i answer differently every time i'm asked <laughs> um but uh doug casey was really uh an impactful interview he wrote the book crisis investing uh, in the seventies. And it was a, a bestseller for a really long time. And during his interview, there were a couple of things. Uh, one, he told me that, you know, anytime I'm trying to do anything in the U S like I'm just a filmmaker, or I'm just an economist or, or whatever, uh, uh, position you have. But when you go around the world, uh, you know, you're an American filmmaker, you're an American economist. And so he just gave me the advice of use that to your advantage. And, uh, get it to open doors for you. And so after uh, I shot that interview with him, uh, I went over to um, do events at the Warsaw School of Economics in Poland. And I went to Vilnius, Lithuania with the Lithuania Free Market Institute, and then did an event with uh, Mises Institute of Estonia in Tallinn. And while I was in Estonia, uh, you know, I had these events. And so I thought, you know, why not? I'll just reach out, see if I can get some interviews. And um, Estonia was kind of pointed at as uh, a country that didn't do all the printing and bailing out uh, that the U.S. did. Um, they kind of had a slightly different approach. Um, although as I got there, I found it wasn't necessarily for uh, pure Austrian uh, economics reasons. Um, but because, uh, because I was an American filmmaker, I got to interview their social minister, their finance minister, and their prime minister while I was there. And it's not something that even made it into the movie, but it was a, an awesome experience for me. And then the other thing that Doug Casey uh, said was I asked him about the Community Reinvestment Act, which is a thing we get into in the, in the movie. And uh, he said, honestly, Jimmy, I don't pay attention to any of that shit. He basically was telling me that, like, don't get lost in the weeds of all this. You know, you can spend your whole life studying every little thing that the government does wrong or every little thing that, you know, someone gets screwed over. Um, but at the end of the day, like if you're just looking at all this, all those little details, um, you're kind of missing out on, on your life. And so I think that's really great advice of, uh, you know, it's important to learn a lot about these things. Um, but it's also important to realize, you know, there, there's a point where you got to have balance with your life and you can't just only listen to economics every second of every day. Um, and so that, that was really great advice. Yeah, though Casey, he's really a, a wealth of knowledge. Um, but yeah. Jimmy, you, yeah, he is. You set out to speak with these people because you wanted to understand how they knew that there was a housing bubble and how it was inflated in the first place. And since you've spoken with them, I wanted to ask you, how were they able to see this bubble and forecast its eventual collapse? Yeah, like I said before, it really was the Austrian School of Economics, I believe, that gave them the tools um, to understand this. And what, what that entails, you know, I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar, or maybe uh, hopefully they'll check out the movie, which is really the best way, I think, of uh, getting a great uh, comprehensive introduction to a lot of these uh, issues. Um, but basically, the idea is that uh, the Federal Reserve is creating money. Uh, they, they're just creating money out of thin air to push interest rates down. And when they do that, when interest rates go down, that tells everyone, it tells us as people spending money or saving money, uh, it tells entrepreneurs that are trying to start projects, it tells them that there's more savings out there than actually exists. And so this is a problem in the long run. This isn't something that can just continue forever. And it creates all these distortions in the economy. And so what we've seen as the pattern with uh, these crashes is that there, the Federal Reserve, uh, in combination with the banks, has created a lot of money leading up leading up to these uh, things. And so that pushes those interest rates down, creates all these distortions, um, and eventually that stuff has to unwind. Uh, and as far as like what uh, sector of the economy it's in, a lot of time there's uh, regulations that kind of direct that new money into certain sectors. And in, in this case, that was definitely true with housing. And there are a lot of regulations uh, that encourage the banks to get into housing um, and mortgage-backed securities. You know, they packaged up these uh, homes, and uh, they could have uh, they could be far more leveraged. Their reserve ratio is far lower uh, at the banks if they had mortgage-backed securities than if they had regular home loans or if they made a loan to a business. So since they're just uh, creating money and getting bailed out by the government if things go wrong, banks had every incentive to just 
you know, get as leveraged up as possible uh, in these mortgage-backed securities. And, you know, at the end of the day, we found uh, that that didn't work very well. You know, there were a lot of consequences for a lot of years. And it seems like people have kind of forgotten about it now. But my hope is that uh, seeing the movie will help people avoid some of these same mistakes, this next crash, and going into the future. As you were researching and, and talking to people, how um did you look into how massive the impact was or the fallout from the housing bubble, especially on the working class? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that uh, is very important. And it's something Ron Paul talks ab about in the sequel, actually, uh, is that the middle class and the uh, upper lower class, um, they really are the ones impacted the most. Because if you're not getting those transfer payments like welfare and the handouts, uh, other uh, transfer payments, if you're not getting those, um, then you're not getting that printed money first. Or if you're not a banker, if you're not connected into Wall Street, um, then you're not getting that printed money first. And so when it goes through the economy, it makes its way from business to business. Uh, you know, it's not worth as much when it gets to you. And so you're paying higher prices through that whole process without getting any of the benefit of the printed money. And so it's really a, a massive wealth transfer, I believe, to the people that receive the direct transfer payments and it, on an even larger scale, the banks and, you know, Wall Street. And that's something we've really seen play out in the last 10 years where they've done all this on such a, a grander scale than they ever had before. And, you know, it's been great for Wall Street and it's been great for propping all that up. Uh, but Main Street hasn't uh, really seen seen the rise uh, as well. So if, if you own assets, you know, you're happy asset prices are up. Um, but if you're trying to buy a house, you know, it's kind of a, a sucker deal for us when we're trying to uh, build homes or buy homes uh, and we can't afford them because the government's done everything they can to prop them up. But as you were looking into this, it, you weren't just studying the 2007, 2008 uh, crisis. You were also looking into the, the Great Depression, the stagflation of the 70s, the, the dot-com bubble. What led you to look back at these past events? What, what were you, you hoping to find? Yeah, I thought uh, really we had to look, we couldn't just look at one crash if we were going to try to present like a school of economics, like their worldview, um, because people are just going to be like, oh, you know, that was a one off thing. And so we had to compare it uh, with other crashes. And thankfully, Tom Woods is a, an economic historian who uh, has done some great work on the Panic of 1920 and writing on the Great Depression. Robert Murphy uh, is an economist who is a script consultant on the film, and he has a great book uh, on the Great Depression. And uh, so I, I had all this uh, information that these people were giving me, and that's, that's really why we split it into two movies, because we knew there was all this uh, stuff we wanted to cover, and if we tried to just skim over everything, uh, it just wouldn't work. And so what we did was... I kind of wrote it as a four-part miniseries and then tried to condense it into, into one movie, and I wasn't able to do it. And so I just took the first two episodes and made that the housing bubble movie. I took the last two episodes, that's the sequel, The Bigger Bubble. And so uh, the first movie, the first episode, starts with the causes of the housing bubble. We make our case of, against the Fed and uh, against the regulations that caused the housing bubble. But then uh, the second episode or the second half of the first movie, we go back, like you said, and we look at the Great Depression. We compare the causes of that um, to what we saw. And then not only that, we start looking at the responses and we say, OK, in the Great Depression, they printed a bunch of money. They bailed out banks. They, uh, you know, tried to prop up everything they could, prices, wages, you know, everything. Um, and in 1920, they did the opposite. They cut government spending in half. The federal budget was actually cut in half, which is just unheard of. You know, no, they can't even cut it by a dollar anymore. Um, but they cut it in half. They were able to balance the budget and uh, allow interest rates to go back up. And because they did that, they had, you know, uh, a, a much shorter crash. You know, the problems had already been created uh, that they had to deal with. You know, the money had already been created earlier um, and those distortions had already happened. But they were able to deal with that, uh, those distortions and adjust back to reality much quicker. Whereas what we've seen from 2008 to today is more like the Great Depression, where they're just trying to prop everything up as it was. Um, and it's just creating bigger problems down the road. Yeah, you know, I, I guess, you know, speaking of the, the Great Depression, uh, the Krugmans of the world, they like to say that gold was the cause or part of the cause for the Great Depression. 
Was that your finding when you looked into it? No, I think uh, what you see is a lot of times like a country will go to war or something like that. Um, and then they'll create money during the war. And then after the war, they'll try to go back to everything as normal. And they'll say, hey, you know, we're going back on the gold standard or the silver gold standard or, you know, whatever it is. And they'll say, we're just going to have that same rate uh, for uh, gold to the dollar or to the British pound or whatever. We're going to have that same rate as we did before the war. And so it's the same effect where you're creating all this money and the gold, uh, you know, it's not the gold's fault that they created more uh, paper money uh, than they actually had backing it up. It, it's not like something where we started with this paper money and then we added the gold to the situation. The paper money was supposed to just be a certificate for the gold where, hey, you could take this in and redeem it and get your actual gold back. It was just a matter of convenience to carry the paper instead of the actual gold. Um, but what we've seen since is uh, the, the federal government does not want us to have gold. They want us to have the paper money. Yeah. And I guess speaking of the federal government not wanting us to have gold, um, you also covered Executive Order 6102 enacted by President Roosevelt back in 1933 to forbid the hoarding of gold coin, bullion, and gold certificates. And the stated reason for the order was that Hard times had caused hoarding of gold, stalling economic growth, and worsening the depression. What's your take on this executive order? Was the problem really the hoarding of gold, or was it just a bankrupt government desperate to get its hands on gold to shore up confidence in Federal Reserve notes? Yeah, it's exactly how you put it. That's a great way of describing it because it was literally that the uh, you know the debt was spiraling out of control, the dollar was spiraling out of control, and they didn't know what else to do. And so they seized everybody's gold. Uh, the president just started dictating what the price of gold would be. He would just announce it each day, which is just you know how socialist can you get? How absurd! Um, but I thought it was important just uh, as a, a part of our history to show that, like, look, this wasn't a voluntary system they set up. You know, they they actually just took everybody's gold and threatened them with jail. Um, and, you know, I don't know that it's going to happen again, but it's not something that we should pretend is impossible. Um, because back then, you know, if you had uh, gold in a lockbox at your bank, you didn't get it back. You know, so it's it's something where people... Uh, not to be paranoid, but, you know, you got to protect yourself if you're in a place where there's a big, powerful government that wants to take your gold. And you never know what's going to happen as this plays out, because um, throughout history, things have tended to go back onto some form of gold standard. Um, and you would think that uh, gold is going to play a huge role uh, in this going forward as the dollar kind of... Uh, we watched the fall of the dollar as the world reserve currency. And, uh, you know, we had a great hundred year run, but most world reserve currencies don't last longer than or much longer than what we've lasted. Um, and with everything uh, the Fed's done in the last 20 years, it's just one crash after another. And their responses are just more insane each and every time. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's why I own gold and silver. <laughs> A lot of us do, and exactly for, for the same reasons, and keeping it at the bank, it's not a good idea. So you, you mentioned um, Executive Order 6102 and how you, you don't know if it will come into play again or if it may not come into play again. But how about some type of, let's say, variant to 6102? Do, do you foresee maybe some type of variant to it? Um. I could see something where, like, if you reported capital gains tax uh, on on gold or something like that, uh, I could see them coming back after after the crash or during the crash and saying, oh, all these people have made all this money on the rise in gold. And so I could see, like, some sort of wealth tax where they're, like, uh, targeting uh you know, people that own gold and maybe not necessarily even going after the gold, but just saying, you know, you're going to have to pay a, a bigger tax on this or a past tax. You know, who knows what they're going to do? Um, we're, we're in a situation where back in 2008, the Fed, even though it was illegal, they just started bailing out foreign banks and doing all these secret uh, loans, literally trillions of dollars of loans. When everybody's over in Washington arguing about a $700 billion TARP bailout, the Fed was just doing, you know, a couple trillion dollars in secret loans. So we saw that last time. This time, the Fed is just going out and buying 
bonds from actual businesses, individual businesses. And then they'll hold a little press conference and be like, hey, by the way, we bought all this debt off the books of these hundred companies. And in the next couple of months, we're going to buy all the debt or not all the debt, but we're going to buy a bunch of corporate debt and bail out uh, these other few hundred companies. And it's just, man, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine that we would ever get to this point. Um, but it really makes you think that uh, nothing's off the table anymore. You know, they're just going to do whatever they can. They're going to buy stocks. They're going to buy you know, they're already uh, intervening in index funds and stuff like that. And it's just, it's a crazy time to be alive. Um, and I, I really hope my documentary can give people the background knowledge they need uh, to discuss these issues and feel more educated on them. Jimmy, would you agree that the biggest commonality in all these crises that you have looked at basically is the ability to print money out of thin air? I, I mean, would you say that this is the root cause of all of these crises. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's not like, you know, we focus on the Fed a lot uh, just because we're focusing on the United States. Uh, but in the second movie, we do get into other central banks. And uh, that's something we've seen a lot in the last 10 to 15 years is it's not just the Fed uh, doing this stuff now. Like everybody is just printing insane amounts. And uh, the ECB hasn't uh, had as drastic a uh, response this year as the Fed has. Uh, but, you know, they're talking about more stimulus. And it's, we're kind of in a situation where it's just everybody's going around in a circle announcing different stimulus bills and unemployment packages. And, all you know, all that stuff costs money. And we already had an over trillion dollar deficit uh, before the coronavirus happened. And now, you know. Who knows? Like, there's different estimates, three, four trillion dollars just in one year. Uh, it certainly feels like even without the coronavirus, we were at a tipping point. Um, but with all the lockdowns and everything, you know, it's just nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody. Yeah. You've, you've mentioned words like insane, uh, crazy. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I got I to ask you, though, when um when you premiered your, your movie back in 2018 at the Anthem Film Festival, what was the reaction of the audience to to that film? Did anyone share with you how the film impacted them? Yeah, that's been one of the best parts is getting to go do screenings and, you know, going to college campuses and stuff and having students talk about how it kind of helped everything click into place. And, you know, they'd heard about some of this stuff, but never really had it all in one spot before. Um, so that stuff's been really great. The Anthem Film Festival is incredible. I absolutely recommend it to everyone. Uh, it's part of Freedom Fest that Mark Skousen puts on in Las Vegas. There's tons of huge names there, and it's so much fun. There's films from all around the world, and uh, there's a lot of filmmakers that answer questions and stuff like that. Um, but we, we were really lucky. We had like 300 people at our premiere, and it was very rewarding for me because I had gone to Freedom Fest in 2012 and premiered a teaser for the documentary and promised to have the documentary done by uh, the next year in 2013. And so to come back five years later in 2018 with it uh, mostly done uh, was, was very rewarding. I basically kind of, the project got bigger than I ever could have imagined by doing the two films at once. And I over leveraged myself, which is really ironic. You're working on a sequel called The Bigger Bubble. In your own words, what is this bigger bubble? Yeah, that's the big question, right? Um, so like I said, you know, the the Fed has massively intervened uh, in the economy in the last decade. Uh, not only had they pushed interest rate, rates down, they pushed them down uh, to 1% in the run up to the housing bubble for a year. Uh, this time, they pushed them down to 0% for almost a decade. And the whole time they said, you know, it's okay, we're creating all this money, we're buying all these mortgage-backed securities, we're buying all this government debt. It's okay, eventually we're going to allow rates to go back up, we're going to sell all that stuff. Um, but, you know, we knew that would never actually happen, because if they dump all that on the market, it's going to crash the economy. And so uh, it was kind of one of those things where it was just a bait and switch, and uh, every year they would just be like, well, it's not quite time yet. And, you know, eventually they finally got to the point where they didn't have a choice. They had to at least try something. And so they allowed interest rates to go up just a couple percent. They sold a, a very small fraction of what they'd gotten, you know, just like nothing uh, compared to the, the scope of all this. And uh, 
the market started to go down and they panicked. And so, uh, you know, Donald Trump put the pressure on Jerome Powell to push interest rates back down. And uh, and he did, you know, uh, the coronavirus happened and all this uh, all these insane bailouts and uh, money printing has happened since the coronavirus. But what people don't realize is they had actually turned. Uh, the printing presses around back last fall. They'd already stopped selling all this stuff. They'd already started printing money and pushing interest rates back down. So it's uh, without the coronavirus, we still would have had a, a crash. And I think we probably would have had to deal with things sooner uh, than we would have otherwise, because the coronavirus has kind of given them this excuse where everything's been put on hold. You know, they're just uh, creating massive amounts of money. And everything's just kind of up in the air right now. Nobody really knows how this is going to play out. But it's interesting what you said where um, I think it was 2018. We, we only made it up to about, what, two and a quarter, two and a half percent or so. And then it had to yeah. come back down. And then 2019, we saw the commotion going on in, in the repo market. And here we are, 2020. So um, things were already bad before the, before the right. virus came into play, just as you said. Um, so I'll put you on the spot now. How soon could this bubble oh. burst, Jimmy? Well, that is one thing that uh, people get into a lot of trouble is uh, trying to say timing. And, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm really glad the Austrian School of Economics doesn't claim to be able to predict timing. Because like I said earlier, you know, you're dealing with uh, hundreds of millions, billions of people making decisions every day. And there's no way you can uh, can predict anything in a situation like that. Um you know, that being said, uh, before all this happened, uh, the U.S. was basically going to have a debt crisis in the next decade. You know, they're looking at unfunded liabilities where they've made all these promises to Medicare and Social Security and all these, uh, you know, retire people, people that are retiring that are expecting all this stuff to be there. And uh, even the federal government, even the CBO, you know, they all admit that like in 10 years, the U.S. was screwed. Like they don't know what they're going to do. So they're going to have to cut benefits or they're going to have to print their way out of it. And with the coronavirus and everything that's happened in the last year and with, you know, the last decade and all the distortions they've done, uh, they've knocked all that. You know, we were looking at dealing with things. 10, 15 years down the road, and all those CBO projections are, you know, skyrocketing forward. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I'm somebody that, you know, we, I think a lot of people were guilty in 2013, 2014 of saying, oh, this can't go on for another five or six years. There were some people in the film that said it would, um, but I just, I don't know, man, you, you think to yourself, man, they just can't, keep doing this and then especially with the lockdowns like there's all these supply chain issues and it's just like uh, social unrest in the u.s is already out of control a little bit and it, it's it's hard to imagine where this is going to go i don't think we're in a civil war yet but it certainly seems like that's uh an inevitable uh uh thing in the united states um so as far as when the next crash will happen who knows? Uh, it's something you can't, especially when the Fed uh, one day will announce they're doing this and the next day they'll announce they're doing something else. Like you just have no way of knowing. Uh, all we can do is just kind of try to protect ourselves. Um, and it's something where everybody's going to lose a lot of money. So at this point, we're just trying to lose less money than everybody else, I guess. From from all the people that you spoke to and, and you talked to a lot of uh, big names, a lot of heavy hitters, knowledgeable people. from what you were able to take from them, how do we protect ourselves from the, the consequences after this bubble bursts? Yeah, I think um, gold and silver obviously is a very common theme. Um, and it, that's more of it being uh, a way of saving some money. It's not necessarily like it's meant to be this wild speculative investment, although at times it is. Um, but it's more meant to just not you're trying to not lose value. Uh, it's, it's the way you're, you kind of have this insurance policy of, uh, I have some gold and silver um, to protect myself in, in case everything goes crazy. And um, I, so yeah, you know, everybody says that in the film, um, even the ones who weren't saying to buy gold and silver at certain points over the last decade are now. Uh, Warren Buffett is in the film, but even he's buying uh, Barrick gold now, which is interesting, uh, and selling his bank stocks. Um, 
But, uh, you know, Jim Rogers, who I have uh, an incredible amount of respect for, uh, is very big on agriculture. Um, so that's something that I'm interested in. Uh, I live in Iowa in the U.S., so that's kind of big around here. Um, but really, uh, a, a key thing that people say is just diversifying away from the dollar. You know, um, there are other countries out there, as you know, uh, being in Singapore. Um, and there's a, a kind of a shift happening in the world where it's not like things in Asia uh, are perfect by any means, um, but, you know, they're growing and uh, they're on the, uh, the long-term upswing, whereas the U.S. is the dynasty that's, that's toward the end. How's your progress on the bigger bubble and is the plan to release it before the bubble bursts to serve as a warning or is it going to be released after? Well, I think if people watch the first film uh that kind of serves enough as a warning um i you, you know there's uh, we tried to make it where people could learn our core lessons uh whether they watch the first film or the second film and really they can watch it in either order they'll be able to watch the second film and then go back and watch the first film if they want to learn more um so uh in that aspect i think it's good but um we're we're really hoping to get the film out uh next year um, I, I, I was more concerned about getting things out before crashes, you know, five years ago. And now, uh, I'm more just trying, and really this is the reason it took so long is because, uh, I want these things to last. I want these documentaries to stand the test of time and be the definitive, uh, look at, at these crashes, uh, whether it's uh, a year from now or 20 years from now or 50 years from now. We, we had a lot of fun making the first one, and I'm really excited for everybody to see it. I can't wait to hear what everybody thinks. Um, but I'm really, really excited about the second one. We're going to be able to reach a lot of new people, I think. Jimmy, before we wrap up, can you let our viewers know how they can watch your film, The Housing Bubble? Yes, our website is thebubblefilms.com. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter, but the easiest way is to just go to thebubblefilms.com, uh, or my production company website is letusdisagree.com. Um, and there you can uh, order a Blu-ray or a DVD. Uh, it's only $10. Uh, in the U.S., shipping is $3. Uh, outside of the U.S., it's $10. So if you don't want to spend $20 on a movie, I get it. Um, but we also have a digital option. Uh, Vimeo is uh, an app that you have on pretty much any device. Um, so go ahead and uh, go to thebubblefilms.com, and you can always just click on the digital option and just pay the $10 and not have to deal with shipping. Um, but yeah, so, uh, we have a mailing list and everything if people want to hear about the sequel and, um, we're, we're really excited. There's a lot of other content on our site too. You know, we've got the raw footage from interviews, we've had tons of podcasts over the years, um, and, and lots of cool videos. So, uh, and I'd, I'd like to encourage people to check out some of my other stuff, like my music videos. Uh, I made a movie rock steppy, which, well, I, I produced it and ran a camera on it. It was actually uh, co-written by our composer, um, but it's an interesting story about two naive brothers uh, who go to South by Southwest Music Festival in Austin, Texas, thinking it's uh, like American Idol, and they're just going to audition, and they're going to make it. Um, and then they end up going on an RV adventure across the country to L.A. and back. Um, so it, it's a fun movie. It's on Amazon Prime. Um, and then the other project that I'm really excited about that I'm going to be working on is called The Iron Men. It's about uh, a Heisman uh, winner in the United States, football player um, back during the Great Depression, Niall Kinnick from the University of Iowa. And uh, it's a really interesting story. He was a Christian scientist. Uh, the new coach they brought in was a practicing physician, uh, which Christian scientists weren't cool with. Um, but they had this incredible relationship, and he ended up going on to win the Heisman and then dying uh, in the war instead of going to the NFL, not to spoil the movie or anything. Uh, but uh, I'm really excited about it. It's kind of on hold now with the coronavirus, um, but I've shot some behind the scenes stuff for them. Um, and it's, uh, it's gonna be a cool project. It's co-written by Nicholas Meyer, who wrote and directed Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, which was amazing. And uh, so it, it's something for people to look out uh, for in the future once things settle down and people start making movies again. Okay, Jimmy Morrison, we, we thank you for the time you've given us, and we're going to be on the lookout for these films. And um, we do wish you all the best in Iowa, and uh, hopefully things get better there. Yeah, thanks for having me on, and uh, hopefully sometime I'll see you out in Singapore. That was Jimmy Morrison, the creator of the film The Housing Bubble. 
To find out more about his work, please visit thebubblefilms.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SPTV channel to be updated on new content. Do also check out the SPTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.